I'm Mary Rowe from the Municipal Art Society, and we're thrilled to welcome you here. Um, I, I've got lots of logistical stuff that we can review as the day wears on, but the first thing I want to do is introduce to you Vince Cipolla, who's the president of the Municipal Art Society. Thank you, Mary. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for being here today, uh, for charting the road to resilience from the ground up especially on a Saturday morning, mild, atmospheric, foggy. Um, MAS is in the movement building business to ensure our city is a livable and a resilient one and that we learn from and share our experiences with other great world cities addressing many of the same issues. Every few years, we join a new club of cities that has to deal with another kind of shock the most recent, of course, being the effects of Superstorm uh, Sandy. Now, resilience is part of everyone's vocabulary, but we at MAS recognized that resilience was a priority long before Sandy. We need resilient housing options, transportation choices, streets that work, safe neighborhoods, diversity of employment, vibrant arts and culture, and beautiful and effective public spaces. We need it all. And 2013 is a very important year for New Yorkers as we begin to think about a new administration to help lead this city forward. We at MAS think New York City is at a crucial moment. We need to be bold and resourceful in how we respond to it. Our resilience work is part of a larger agenda setting process we're going to roll out all year to challenge the new administration in the areas we agree need renewed focus and attention. And we all know resilience will be near, if not at the top, of our shared lists. That's why your discussions today are important. We're all listening to what you are saying, to the lessons we have learned over the last two months, and to what we collectively think should be the sandy principles, principles of resilience. We want everyone in the city, policymakers, entrepreneurs, civil society leaders, community leaders, foundations, all of us to embrace what we develop here today. This has been a huge, huge team effort to make the events of yesterday and today happen and with very little time to organize the holidays thrown in the middle, of course. So let's just remind ourselves who are the ones building a more resilient New York. If you are the president of the new school, who stepped up right away and said they'd host us here uh, today for free, uh, stand up, but David's already standing up, so thank you very much. <laughs> if you were on our many, many noisy planning calls, noisy, noisy planning calls, um, leading up to this event, stand up. Come on, stand up, Mary Rowe. <laughs> yeah. If you are one of the resource people or facilitators who pulled together more than 20 working sessions that will take place today, stand up. Come on, I know there are 20 of you. If you are on a plenary session, stand up. We're gonna get the blood circulating here early on a Saturday. If you've come all the way from New Orleans, to shoulder to shoulder with us here in New York, stand up. Right. If you're here from New Jersey or Connecticut and have your own hands full, but still had time to come over here and work this through with us, stand up. If you hosted or are one of the 100 plus who went on a site visit yesterday, to see firsthand the impact of the storms and the challenges our neighborhoods are facing, stand up. All right. If you work for or are affiliated with one of the over 80 organizations or city departments or volunteer groups that partnered with us today, stand up. And. Uh, you know, just for getting up early on a Saturday, stand up. <laughs> um, with the tremendous staff of MAS who proudly make this work their own every day, stand up. Yeah. 
If you are one of the many watching us right now on live stream or following along on Twitter, <laughs> at hashtag Road to Resilience, stand up <laughs> or get in the subway and come on down. This is who is building up the cultural, social, environmental, and economic resilience of New York City. Thank you again very much for coming, and it's going to be an informative and great day. I'm so pleased to introduce David Van Zant, president of the New School. Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Finn. I'm glad to see you're starting to get the blood, blood moving in the room here. So um, we are thrilled. Uh, we are thrilled to be here and partner um, with the Municipal Arts Society on, on this conference. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this symposium, Charting the Road to Resilience, which is an important conversation uh, at the, a critical time about the lessons that we can learn from um, or should learn from Hurricane Sandy. I think both the Municipal Arts Society, the MAS, and the New School are two long-standing uh, New York institutions, uh, long and great histories, done many different things over those years. So I think it's particularly good that we link together for um, this very important event for New York City. The New School is a, is a place we have a strong commitment to, to two basic principles. One is um, creativity, innovation, challenging the status quo. And the second is being publicly engaged to try to make the world a better place. I couldn't think of a, a better conference in which to, to um, uh, uh, follow those two, those two principles. We encourage, it, we encourage the crossing of disciplines, which combine design and social science, to challenge current paradigms, solve problems, and to find ways to contribute to the public good. And we place great value on our students becoming critically engaged citizens of the world. Encourage them to take their skills and knowledge whether it's in architecture and urban design, social research, history, public policy, environmental studies, or documentary studies, and many others to become leaders in their communities for positive change. As all of you are doing here, all of you are doing here today. We have a long tradition of initiating and welcoming dialogues on critical social, economic, and political and cultural issues of our day. Again, which is why we're so pleased to be here today uh, with MAS. The New School actually escaped, at least right here, uh, without too much harm from Hurricane Sandy, but many members of our community were deeply affected by it and continue to this day to be affected uh, uh, by it. Uh, Hurricane Sandy is now making us ask very tough questions uh, and try to rethink how we build, grow, organize, and get involved in analyze and communicate information. It's also forced us to think uh, how we take care of our infrastructure, our communities, and each other. And many in our region are still, uh, still suffering the consequences of the hurricane. Most of you here today uh, have been leading the charge in trying to figure out the best practices and lessons learned, whether it's addressing individual communities' immediate needs and proposing new ideas for the city's long-term outlook. And for that, I applaud you. And I also encourage you to think boldly, to reach out uh, to each other and share your knowledge. Looking over today's schedule, I'm, I'm struck not only by the great number and variety of voices represented here, but by the masterful way the panels and working sessions have been organized. Again, I salute MAS uh, for their leadership. Um, thank you very much. Finally, let me just say, again, welcome all of you to the new school. It looks like a great day. I hope you, I hope you enjoy it, and we will, we will see you around, okay? Okay. Um, so uh, most of you, I think, have an agenda that in front of you. You can see how things are going to shape up. Um, and while I'm talking, I hope that the mapping people will come out. I might have to go get them. Just a sec. They're coming. Come on. Okay. Um, so just a couple of things. First of all, um, as Vin said, we're live streaming and we want the discussion to continue. This really has been an iterative process. So just right off the bat, let's just acknowledge we are all experts. 
There were many, many folks that could go on sessions and volunteer to do so. So these have really self-organized. The working sessions that started at 11 or 11.15 um, are all being enabled or facilitated by people that have particular things that they think are re relevant questions. But we really want this to be a participatory thing, and there are me we're all experts. So um, that's why you'll hear inconsistently, this is, has to be a collective kind of listening exercise, which is how we've designed the program. It's really about listening. Um, and you'll see that the first two sessions this morning deal with d data and specifically giving us a kind of briefing about what the situation really looks like. Many of you were out on site visit yesterday or have actually been in these communities on a regular basis over the last couple of months. You'll have lots to contribute. And during the working sessions, that's where, where you'll have the chance to do that. We're going to hear a little bit from these folks about just visualizing um, what, we can, what, we, what has actually occurred. And then after that, we're going to talk a little bit about the sort of implications um, if you look beyond that, you'll see we have a couple of scientists to talk to us about what's ahead or what could be ahead. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the community responses. So this morning is supposed to basically give us a context for the discussions you're going to break out into where you really start to talk about four key things. What worked well? What didn't work so well? What are the, the lessons that we need to glean from our experience over the last few months? And then what are some principles, as you heard Vin suggest? We're going to see whether or not there are some principles for us to glean. The other thing just to point out at the outset is that we recognize that this is not just about Superstorm Sandy. It's about lots and lots of challenges that preceded that, that the, st that the storms have exacerbated and made us more aware of. So don't feel confined to talk exp only about the effects of uh, the late October, early November, nor'easter events. Don't just feel like that. It's, this is a broad discussion about how we build resilience in all the different manifestations of it, economic, environmental, social, all those things. So this is our day to really craft that. And I'm going to encourage us to use the plenaries for these briefings and then the working sessions to really get down to the details. So uh, in terms of this data briefing, we've got three panelists. Um, the other thing we're doing is you've all got uh, um, access to technology that allows you to Google these people, so we are not uh, 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 reading out long bios. You can pretty much read where they're from. Max is from the Furman Center, Abby's from Culture Now, and Ilya has an architectural and art practice. Um, Google them, you'll find out more about them. We're really appreciative that they took the time to be with us, and they're now going to tell us a little bit about the real picture. So would you welcome our three? Over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Max Wesselcouch, and I'm a research analyst at the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. Um, and I'm just going to kind of start off the day with the 30,000 foot look at uh, what we know about Hurricane Sandy and um, the damage that it caused, and a lot of what we don't know yet, um, but hopefully we'll learn um, as we continue uh, to study the hurricane. Uh, next slide. So, uh, this is a map. Um, for many of you, it's probably not the first time you've seen um, the, uh, the modeled extent of the surge in Hurricane Sandy, and it, I can guarantee it won't be the last time you'll see it uh, in this, even just in this session. Um, and uh, at the Furman Center, we've overlaid this uh, map of the surge extent with uh, data that we have on every property in New York City to try to get an understanding of how many buildings were in the surge area. Um, and what we find, sorry, can we, uh, is that there are about uh, 32,000 uh, buildings um, and 300,000 residential units in uh, the surge area. We also then overlaid that map uh, with the hurricane evacuation zone A. Um, and one of the remarkable things is that it really, um, the surge extent actually uh, very much uh, looked similar to the evacuation zone A. Um, so that's one of the remarkable things is that the, uh, the evacuation zone was quite well modeled, um, except for a few areas right around Jamaica Bay. Um, if we then look though at uh, all three of the evacuation zones, A, B, and C, uh, we see that uh, next time could be much worse. There are actually over a million units of housing within the three evacuation zones. So when we think about next time, we have to think about um, how much worse it may be. Uh, this data is um, of uh, households who have registered with FEMA as having sustained some sort of damage. These are registrations that are current um, as of the end of November, which is the most recent data that's available right now. 
Um, and the light to dark red um, shows the share of housing units in a census tract uh, that have registered with FEMA. Um, both owners and renters can register with FEMA. Um, it's reassuring that <laughs> this map lines up really well with the surge extent, so we feel like we have some authority by looking at the surge extent. Um, there's variation in who was hit the hardest, but uh, you can see on the Rockaways um, in certain areas, it's almost every household has registered with FEMA, indicating that they've sustained some sort of damage. Uh, and similarly, on the uh, eastern coast of Staten Island, we see in the, these really high levels um, of households who have registered with FEMA. Uh, we then look at um, how many uh, public housing projects were in the surge area. Um, this is uh, something that's been reported on quite a bit in the New York Times and other places, that there are about 400 uh, NYCHA buildings in the surge area that sustained some sort of damage. Um, and I think it's about uh, 80,000 residents in those buildings. Um, many of those buildings are older buildings. Um, many of them had basements that flooded, which led to electricity and boiler problems um, that actually took a, quite a long time to resolve. Uh, at the Furman Center, uh, there's also, we also looked at um, these other uh, privately owned, publicly subsidized properties through uh, the mitchell Lama program, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, um, HUD insurance, and project-based Section 8. And we found that there were about 80 additional subsidized properties with about 20,000 units um, that were in these surge areas. And similar to the NYCHA properties, they also, many of them sustained um, significant damage. Looking now at um, a breakdown of all of the residential building types uh, in the surge area that may have sustained damage. Um, when you think about FEMA's programs, many of them are geared towards single family homes and homeowners. Um, but in fact, in New York City, most people don't live in single family homes. And that's true um, in these surge areas also. Um, only about a tenth of the housing units are single family homes. Um, and each different housing type has different kinds of challenges uh, for recovery, both in the immediate term and in the long term. For instance, um, an owner of a two to four family home uh, has many of the same, uh, can access the same FEMA programs as a single family homeowner, but if, that, if the tenant who lives in that house has already moved out because of the damage, then the owner is no longer getting that critical source of rental income, so they may have a harder time finding the funds to rebuild uh, the house. Um, we talked about NYCHA and the subsidized rental properties. Um, there are also a lot of stabilized rental properties in these areas. Um, there are some uh, myriad of legal issues uh, with the stabilized stock that I won't get into here, but um, suffice to say that uh, it, is, it could be a concern that we could lose some of these valuable stabilized units. Uh, and then another important thing is um, how old these properties are. Uh, over three quarters of the properties in the surge area were built uh, more than 40 years ago, um, indicating that they probably weren't built up to the current uh, flood regulations. Um, and also, if they have to be significantly rebuilt, um, they may have to conform to new zoning and building codes um, that weren't in place at the time they were originally built. Uh, and when we look at the, um, the demographics of the population uh, living in the surge area, we see that um, Almost 30% of the households had children, uh, and those uh, children uh, may have had to move schools, may have been out of school for some time, so we'll want to pay particular attention to the effects on the children in the surge area. Um, and then also, uh, we're often concerned about seniors in these situations, because they may be the least able to help themselves. Um, and the, the areas affected by Hurricane Sandy tend to have actually older populations than New York City as a whole. And 12% of the households are actually seniors living alone who might not have access to um, any help. Uh, and finally, uh, when we think about kind of the financial picture and the ability to recover losses, I apologize, um, the renter and owner figures are transposed here. Um, but these are not high income households. Um, so the median income of renters um, in the surge area is only about $36,000. And the median household income for owners is only about $80,000. These houses that were affected are often um, uh, quite expensive in the $200,000 to $300,000 range. So, um, and the FEMA subsidy, I think, is only about $30,000. So um, even if we have kind of the architectural solution to some of these, um, we have to 
still remain concerned about kind of the finances of the people involved. So with that, I hope I got you a bit excited, and now I'm going to turn it over to Abby and Ilya uh, to talk about going forward. I've just got to jump in for all those die-hard Twitterers. Here is the password and the ID for to get on the Wi-Fi. Uh, the ID is Sandy, and the password is resilience. Well. I want to introduce myself. I'm Abby Suckle, um, and I am. Not, I was the vice president of the AIA last year, and I'm also the um, president of Culture Now. And this is Ilya Azarov, my partner in crime on this extravaganza. Um, can you turn to the next slide, please? Okay. Those of you want to see the two pictures of nature and um, how it's affected New York. Uh, this is for uh, the Manhattan slide uh, Photoshop of Manhattan as it looked at uh, that the Wildlife Conservation Society did on the left and of course Ewan Bond's picture of um, Lower Manhattan uh, that was on the cover of New York Magazine. Uh, next please. Uh, for those of you, I see a lot of faces in the audience and uh, that we remember from after September 11th and what we went through so we thought we'd just take a step back and talk about uh, our history. Can you, um, so let's talk about September 12th. Next. Uh, those of you, many of you were part of New York New Visions, which was a coalition of all design professionals that came together to um, uh, think about how to rebuild uh, Lower Manhattan. Um, and for all of us, it was kind of like a, uh, how do you do this kind of a, how do, you, how do we inform um, planning long and short term in a place that we want to live in in the city? And looking back, um is exactly what the introduction had stated. We need to look back at how this explosion of data and how we've addressed this in the past to move forward. And if today is that initiation or over these past months, then I think some of these, these, uh, these slides will resonate with you. Yeah, so um, I happen to have been on the Cultural and Historical Committee, and at the time we were tasked basically with trying to get more people back downtown, helping the cultural institutions, and um, Another big issue was planning behind the 16 acres. Pretty much everyone was just focused on that, and we wanted to see downtown as part of a big picture. So as you will recall, um, we wondered if we could use Hugh Hardy uh, uh, mapping as a tool to create a single source for all the data um, and as a means to create a design uh, framework that everyone could use. And Hugh Hardy suggested, let's make a map. So they fell to me, because I was the one he looked at, to actually try to make the map. And many of you will recall that we made a cultural and historical map of Lower Manhattan. We printed the first one, January 2002. Then we printed another one three months later. And each one gets progressively more updated. And um, as more issues arise and as more content um, becomes available, and you can compare the back end of the data. We started taking pictures of things because at the time we had a lot of buildings that were like 253 Broadway and nobody had a clue what Next they were slide, talking please. about. Next slide. Um, wait till they show the back end. Oh, show the back end, please. Yes. Okay, and as more issues came up, you can see the historical buildings that are documented. There was a lot of interest at the time in preserving um, more of Lower Manhattan, so we put all the eligible buildings up, and you can see that that's the um, one on the upper left, and you can see how much more of it there is by three years later, when more things get designated. And you can start to really compare what happened with data and time. But all of this is, is living in um, FileMaker databases, and it's living in a flat, you know, it's basically Illustrator maps. Okay, now our data statistics for that were basically handmade, we counted and this is what you get. If you go to the next slide, we can compare what happened in three critical areas. First is the World Trade Center site, which of course everyone will expect that it changed. And then you can go to something like the ferry access. You will recall that the ferries, um, the ferries, we, there weren't any, then there were lots of ferries, and then the subways come back, and then there are less ferries. And you can see that. Also, people were very interested in what happened in Chinatown, and you know, you can see the attempt to try to make changes, but again, it's a little uh, more below the surface. Um, our maps were used very heavily at all the focus groups. Imagine New York was uh, the one that the Municipal Art Society did, and we, we were uh, docent for that, or uh, docent for that one. Now, the next slide will show you the digital 
Uh, we partnered with a Lower Manhattan Cultural Council and NYPIRG CMAP, which was the state of the art for mapping digitally in, lower Ma in the city. And um, it's New York Public Interest Research Group, and CMAP is, I'm not really sure, but anyway, they were, uh, we got a grant, and this was our online mapping database, which showed cultural assets from Lower Manhattan and all the other places. We pretty much entered everything in it by hand. It was very slow, and it was very hard to maintain. Um, let's jump ahead to um, a couple years later, there was a study done by Guy Nordenson, Catherine Sivet, and Adam Urinsky on sea level rise in Palisades Bay called On the Water, which I would direct you to. That set the stage um, for the next slide, which was the Rising Currents exhibition that MoMA did. And what they did is they had five teams of um, architects and um, architects, planners, uh, urban designers, and um, landscape architects and engineers, and they looked at different sites and how you might address sea level rise in Palisades Bay. Um, Barry Bergdahl from MoMA decided it would be really good if everybody go, went around um, to all the sites and we hypothetically kind of presented the projects in the place that it was. So this is, these are pictures from the night that we went on the first of a, what became half a dozen um, hypothetical cruises. Now, it must be pointed out that all this is driven by data. If you think about the slides prior, this is data and hardcore research that turned into uh, public events, public action, and uh, exhibition. And that is quite important when we're talking about data and what it can manifest in the public realm. Yeah. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then it's another slide of everybody on the boat looking at, um, it's basically potential what could happen because, of course, nothing happened. Um, next slide, please. It, ended up um, more moving to our website, Culture Now, and we began, when we started to develop the iPhone app and the ability to listen to people's voices, then we were able to put the hypothetical, um, it, um, you, you could stand in front of Lower Manhattan, and uh, Stephen Cassell will give you a little podcast about what he was doing on the project. Um, now, let's jump ahead to October 29th. And those of you who ha uh, will remember what happened. Next slide. Next slide. OK. So let's talk about um, the 29th. Next slide. Uh, if you have had any experience with, um, with the city of New York it, prior to this with evacuation, it might have been Irene. So let's take a pause now that we've jumped from 9-11, just briefly Irene was a wonderful dry run or wet, a little wet run, if you will, of how the city has used data mapping and slosh maps modeling to really understand the inundation zones, how to get people out, and what we need to do in case something happens. So this is a, a uh, slosh map, and here's another slosh map. Most of these uh, are used as models that you put in sort of uh, uh, the data that's available. And there's always a question of what data are you using? And so I'll leave that to others to discuss uh, later on, perhaps in the day. But there is uh, a long history of data being used by the city in its response. And it's really wonderful to see Max again. Um, right after, two days after the storm, I'm part of the regional catastrophic planning team. And Max and I had met at OEM uh, at, at an 8.30 meeting and, and meeting after meeting after meeting. One thing that I must tell you about those early days is that data drove the conversation. Next slide, please. Um, you had seen from Max's slides, these are the, the evacuation zones. And if you overlay those with, with the uh, inundation maps uh, and some of the FEMA maps, they don't always match. So it always calls into question where the data is coming from and who's at risk. What is at risk? Um, this is uh, uh, a... Uh, uh, sea level rise and, and estimated uh, current sea level rise uh, that I've pulled many times. Prior to Sandy, my research uh, was, was based on brownfield sites that lie in inundation zones. So Abby was looking at something with uh, cultural centers that might be at risk. Some of our culture in New York. You could be looking at all sorts of different things that you're interested in. My interest was these, these uh, brownfield sites. And these are some of the slides that, oddly enough, I see my friend Klaus Jacob in the audience. We had presented 
um, five weeks before Sandy at uh, Kingsborough Community College, which was inundated in Sandy, and we were in that hall. That hall was probably 12 feet underwater, and we were talking about um, what could potentially happen. And uh, next slide, please. So these are just some of the data sets that I'm interested in, but now let's move forward. So these are maps that my friend Richard Gonzalez, he's with the Design for Risk and Reconstruction Committee, where I co-chair at the AIA, and he produced these maps two or three days right after Sandy. So let's take a look at some of the data here. He was interested in critical infrastructure, including centers where potentially displaced persons will be kept. That is also a secondary displacement of, what's, of the students who use those schools, along with infrastructure such as, oh, I go back please. Go back again. Um, infrastructure such as subways. Forward, please. Um, here's some of the risk zones, and if you overlay those on those critical areas, you can see some of those critical areas aren't protected from some of the known storm surge. Next, please. Um, here's some of the high-level risk flooding based on what FEMA is, is proposing, and those don't exactly match some of the models that even Max put up here, and, and I think that's, that's something that should be discussed today. Next, please. Um, this is sea level rise by 2080, and uh, this, uh, this data um, can also, also be uh, corrected if you look at uh, high tide, moon phase, all of those things, but quite interesting to see where our infrastructure lies. Next, please. These are the low-rise buildings, and this bears out. When we were in the OEM those first days, the first maps that came up were some slosh maps based on modeling, and they said, zone A, 35,000 buildings are inundated. Well, um, Max basically has just mentioned that that's about right, but there's, there, there was a sense that that is a large grain, large scale approach. And even though data drove the conversation, what was missing was the fine grain. And the hunger for that fine grain was very hard to satiate. There is almost no way that that data on the ground can be uploaded or put into the conversation at that high level. So where do you put resources is one of the big issues, and I think, I think being there that, and Ron, you were there as well, there, there was a sense that um, there was a gap between this, this, this large scale to the, to the smaller scale. Next, please. Uh, some of the interesting things that Richard has been looking at are the 311 service calls. You can see where all of the, the, um, phone, the, lines were the phone lines were down. Uh, or maybe they were just all calling 911. <laughs> so I challenge his data and say, Richard, can you do this one again with 911? Next, please. And then, of course, loss of life. So when we're talking about data, you can query anything, depending on the scale and the grain you have, but then you need to sift through the data to understand what you're looking at. So if I look at the 311 calls, I say, well, where's the 911 calls? And does that really speak to a larger issue? Yeah. Please. Um, okay, so let's talk about, first of all, those are flat maps. I mean, basically what he's doing is doing it in Illustrator. This is not, they're not something that lives in a kind of Google GIS, let's generate it um, in real time world. Uh, now, my issue is how do you make the data come alive? Look at Breezy Point. Um, the question is, how do you look at something that came out looking like this? And so the first thing we wanted to think about was, what did the first responders do? Well, they, um, NOAA's site Next one, please. has this uh, really interesting um, before and after pictures. So you can sort of drill down from uh, Google Earth, if you will. And um, you can bring up this up on, um, next please on your iPad. Let's pause just a second. You can bring that on your iPad, and what's really interesting is when I'm talking about real-time data or data from the field, uh, Noah does that as a flyover and then patches that together. That's the exact data that was needed in those rooms at OEM those days, and we didn't have access to it, at least those first two weeks. No, what you had is the brochure, which is the one on the right, which yeah. talks about how do you assess risk, so that's like 50 pages of what do you do and walking around, which is pretty much what everyone did for, since the dawn of time. So let's go back to Lower Manhattan because um, uh, it's really, uh, we're going to look at cultural heritage and preserving that uh, cultural. Now, this is the picture of Lower Manhattan. Next slide. Let's look at some of the Manhattan maps. The first one is the Manitas map. It was done in 1639. It's actually the first one that anybody ever has of New York City. 
Um, and it was obviously not a city. It was the um, Dutch made the map so that people would uh, want to settle here. Next map. Okay, um, I have worked with Eric Sanderson, the Wildlife Conservation Society, and the Manahatta Project. What this is is the ecological communities of 1609. And you know what the project was all about was they imagine what Manhattan would have been like if no one was there. And so this is Manhattan minus life. Um, and they've done, it's an exhaustive survey. It's been on exhibit several times. Um, but it's very valuable because there's so much research done. Next, please. Okay, the definitive map of New York um, that, you know, we've just had its 200th anniversary is the Commissioner's Grid in 1811. Um, and I um, wanted to show you that because that's really kind of what sets the tone of our city. Next, please. Uh, looking at Lower Manhattan again, the other map that people use a lot is the Vielle map. This is what, uh, because it was the sanitation map in 1874, it actually has all the original waters and streams, and um, engineers like it because it you can uh, it shows you how to put foundations in. So um, these are from New York Public Library's collection, but basically that's um, one of the critical maps. And if you do want to overlay Lower Manhattan onto this, what you're going to find after 9-11 is it's pretty close to the original borders. But let's go next to, um, you will recall the C-map that we did in uh, 2002. Um, the Oasis has moved since then into this incredible resource of um, online technical uh, uh, technology where they've got at this point inputted pretty much every uh, digital thing they can think of. And you can create your own maps of areas in the city. So they've got zoning, they've got social things, they've got um, um, the historic maps from New York Public Library's collection. And I'm just gonna show you a few, um, most of their maps uh, if you go to the next one, what you're going to find, a lot of it is social research. This just happens to be a population map of Lower Manhattan. Um, but you can do more with it. Just go to the next. Okay, this is, these are uh, mashup maps. The Montresor map is from New York Public Library's collection. And what it is, is the, it was done, a military map uh, that was done for the, originally probably started around the French and Indian War. The British used it for the Revolutionary War. So it's reasonably accurate because it was done for that. Um, we overlaid it with Manahatta, and then we overlaid it with Google Earth, which you can do online. If you can see, the, the slides don't come out too great. Um, the second one we have is the Poppleton map. The Poppleton map is um, the one after, there was some landfill done after the War of 1812 because there were these uh, battery, you'll see battery um, Castle Clinton. They, they built 12 forts around Manhattan to protect, uh, New York City to protect it. And they started to infill around the water. And Poppleton is the 1817 map. So it's one of those um, points in New York City history. And we did the same thing, overlaying it with Manahatta and Google Earth. Now let's go to the next one. Um, let's talk about preserving our cultural assets. Next, please. OK, this is a map that I made um, for the architectural boat tours um, about it's been updated a couple of times. But anyway, this is looking at the figure ground relationship of what is interesting or we thought was interesting along the water's edge. And then I'm comparing it to the Manahatta um, map that they did a fill and excavation um, between 1609 and 2009. Next, please. Um, and then some of the data, uh, some of the um, um, sites that we thought were significant, we actually um, put little uh, blurbs about on the back. Next, please. Okay, now this is, again, um, back to the Manahatta. They're 1609, and then they're um, juxtaposing it with the more recent view. Next, please. Okay, what I have done on our website, because we've made this incredible resource and we're all online and everything now, is I put a boundary around the FEMA flood zones of um, the uh, ABC zone in just lower Manhattan, so you could see. And I came up with about 500 things. Next, please. And this is the cultural assets in Lower Manhattan. At risk. At ri well, at risk. Yeah. This is it, and it's all on the iPhone, and it's all online. But, um, and it's wherever the state of the art is right now. I mean, and then the last thing we wanted to do is, since this is supposed to be about where do we go from here, we thought this would give you a framework so that we could have the workshops later. So thank you all so much. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it.